Hello, and welcome to the Pragmatic Live podcast series, where we tackle the biggest challenges facing today's product management, product marketing, and other market and data-driven professionals with some of the best minds in the industry. I'm Rebecca Calajaris, Vice President of Marketing and Product Strategy at Pragmatic Institute, and your host for this episode. I am extremely excited today to have Steve Goodyear, founder and product owner of Realizer Services, and the very first person to earn a PMC-8 certification. Welcome, Steve. Thank you. Hi, everybody. All right, Steve. Uh, when we start, give our listeners a little bit of context. Tell me about you, Steve, and your background uh, and, and sort of how you got where you are today. Sure. Thanks. Yeah, my background really came from IT. So I do a lot of uh, information technology work and kind of built up with software and um, uh, through consulting and through, uh, as well as working for companies and and doing that, and then that led, particularly through consulting, of uh, into more designing, designing services, and and now thinking about designing products. Awesome. So, what drove you uh, to become PMC eight? And and for everyone here listening, the eighth course was the design course for you, correct? Our newest one. That's right. Yep, I just did the design one. Uh, about a month ago, I think. Yeah, uh, really, it started um, more recommendations. So in consulting, thinking of, uh, you know, a lot of it was really uh, kind of reinventing the wheel each time a customer has a need and, and thinking, OK, well, we could offer some services around that to thinking, how can we think of that like a product and making it more repeatable and efficient and the customer gets uh, better expectations. They know what they're getting, and uh, you know we're not reinventing the wheel each time. And so we're speaking the same language. And anyways, long story short, someone recommended I try uh, Pragmatic, and so I did the uh, foundation course and then um, the focus and the build. I think, uh, and so I was just trying those really to think from a consulting side. How would I apply that to? professional services and turn professional services into more of a product. And from there, it just kind of ballooned and, and I really liked it. And it was like a really energetic three days and uh, I got a lot out of it. And so then I just kept chipping away at the rest, I guess. Yeah. And then design came out design. I hadn't really intended to be more the, the level eight. It was more, um, an interest of it. I've never really been a designer, although I designed software solutions. It was more thinking through uh, in, in designing software, I'd cross paths with different types of design um, disciplines. And so it was really neat to read about the new course and think of, you know, how that could fill in some of my blind spots and know better where to use those different things and, and how they could apply and then think of how to apply that in, in product design. You know, it's one of the things, one of the things you touched on that I think is so interesting about what we do is so often when people think of product, uh, you know, you used to think of hardware or something with a, you know, a UPC mm. code, then you start to think of, okay, okay, I get software, software as a service. But when you think of products and being able to apply the principles of strong product management, strong product marketing and strong design, you know, it really is, it can be anything. And I think really thinking about how of those uh, implications on services is a really interesting uh, a place to do. And 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 I think those same disciplines can bring so much to a professional services offering. Absolutely, yeah. It, it, the big thing that struck was really uh, the market problem, right? And thinking of the customer problem and, and you know, in professional services, it was easy uh, to, to like, think every time is unique right and and try and guess there's a lot of guessing going on when we're creating a proposal um uh because they only release so much information and then they invite companies to uh to maybe make submit a proposal but then taking that and taking you know the framework and and viewing it through that lens to think okay if this was a product and we were solving that need what would that look like? And that was that was pretty neat. It was a pretty neat experience to go through. I'm still working on it. So there's there's it's a journey, but uh, uh, just that alone of kind of from that first course really um, uh, made a big difference, I think, in my thinking and how I pictured it because it was less, you know, time and materials. Let's just get some smart people to solve a problem, and more thinking, okay, we really understand your problem and. And here's like a package that could solve it. And so it's more predictable for us. It's more predictable for the customer uh, and, and just, just makes that a little, 
um, smoother that that whole experience. Has that switched from uh, switch from sort of time and materials to more solving a problem? Has that changed the way you address pricing? Very much, yeah, and and the pricing uh, will actually help with that too of rethinking less because uh, time and materials uh, it really brings the price around cost and uh, you know cost to us and and then it gets really commoditized to every other consultant out there who charges by the hour and you think oh well your hour is more expensive than theirs and and so it really would bring the conversation to that versus now thinking about it as a product and and really. We address this problem and here's a solution it's less conversation like that and it's more okay the solution will cost this and is that valuable like the, like it's it's really aligning the cost with the value and less about time and materials and 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 uh and that so it could be a, a big thing is it's more predictable for the customer so that's that's better there's there's less change there's less negotiation as you go through it because you know it's it's clear what they're getting um but then the price is clearer for them there's more transparency around that and and it's less commoditized where they're comparing it to to other firms and then for us it could be better if we get really good at it and really efficient um that's one way to make it more pr profitable so uh, over time it could be more profitable so rather than having to to increase our hourly rates we could just get better at delivering uh the things we're good at as as we get good at them and make them repeatable and, and that's such a good point right because the the better you are at the the faster you can deliver them doesn't really change the value right your efficiency doesn't change how valuable it is for them and that way they're also paying for outcomes i mean it's such a powerful switch I think in particular in services uh, to switch from thinking time and materials, here's how many hours to here's the problem, here's the desired outcome, and I can deliver it for X. Yes. Yeah. Because really it's a guess on how many hours because once you pull back the onion and start working with them, uh, you know, it could take longer because because for, for a number of reasons, maybe they take a while to get back to you or, or maybe there's just some thinking that you got to do on it. Um and then there's this pressure to be a little quicker because you're costing them money. The meter's running. Mm -hmm. It's like having a taxi outside rather than, you know, a nice comfortable limo that's going to get you there for around the same price maybe. Uh, but you're not worried about the meter running. Uh, it's kind of this guaranteed ride that's going to be comfortable and, and, and get you from A to B. So let's talk a little bit about uh, design, right? Uh, and and how the design course you might uh, leverage as a professional services sort of offering and provider. Yeah, it was, um, I, I looked at it two lens. Uh, one was really thinking about products and, and the software we deliver. And so it was, it was in part that, but then definitely thinking through uh, as a services organization, what the design would be. And so some big parts there. I mean, one of the standouts from the course was thinking about the user experience map and the journey they go on uh so lining that up and where the decision points are so that's uh you know we could back it up and think from the first time we meet someone who who um has a need on, on a service we could help them with uh what's that experience like and what are the different touch points and 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 then when they engage with us they have a project they want to do um what's that experience like and where that that might have friction or um, uh, slow it down. It, it was neat being able to map that out. That was one of the takeaways I did and, and sort of drew that out more from a, uh, like an engagement and services uh, experience rather than product experience. But it was it was the same idea. It was pretty neat applying it to that because it, it's eye opening where it, it's a good model to be able to think through that whole process and then and then see where's the areas we can we can improve or change to to make it a better experience for everybody and, and simplify some things that maybe aren't necessary um, to improve. Yeah, so that was that was one big standout for sure from the design course. One of the things I think uh, that's so neat about the experience mapping too is there's that sort of emotional elements that you map out there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when there are frustrations, when they're frustrated, when they're worried. And again, uh, not speaking of engaging with you, of course, Steve, but having in my career hired a great deal of professional services and vendors, right? As an executive, there is there is a definite, it, it is a, a different, um, it is a somewhat different buying process than buying uh, hardware or software, right? Where, there, where it is sort of repeatable no matter what. There are all of these contingencies and pieces. And, and so I would imagine as, your clients and really thinking about 
the places sometimes where a professional services provider feels the most confident, like they've got this, is actually where they tend to communicate the least. And mm-hmm. that can in, be inversely felt the other way because that silence can be scary, right? So mm-hmm. again, sort of putting yourself in your customer's shoes and your user's shoes in this case to uh, really let you see even just how communication and updates and uh, the process improvements that you could do on something like professional services. Yeah, definitely. That's a that's a great point. As as I was building out the timeline, you know, thinking of the motion up front is is a lot of questions because you know they might be thinking things like, can they really do what they say they're going to do? Is it going to cost what they say it's going to cost? There's there's all these questions yep. you don't know unless you've worked with them a lot, and you could be putting your reputation internally on this. Uh, you, you know, this could really help your career if you do it. So there's there's a lot of anxiety early on in the process um, that that could help from a professional services side, then we want to craft things. So that way, uh, you know, we've done it before. Um, uh, here's kind of our, our milestones. So we know we're on track. So that way you can be reassured and uh, maybe take away some of that uh, anxiety by reducing the commitment maybe, or, or showing more, showing more of the secret sauce of how we're going to get there and, and, you know, make you look good and build it around there knowing that that's kind of your anxiety early on. And and then following that all the way through to make sure uh, we build on that. But yeah, definitely that's, that's, um, uh, you know, can really help you see because otherwise it's easy to go in and think of it like you're negotiating and, and it's more adversarial or it could lead that way in, in different firms um, uh, on different types of engagements. And, where instead um, we really want to come in and make it more like, well, okay, well, we're here to help you and we're here to, to make you look good. And we're here to solve this, this particular problem. Um, and, you know, here's our approach and here's what you can expect and, and really build it more around reassuring and, and a partnership rather than, yeah, kind of, kind of that negotiation. And, and you're right, you know, knowing when to bring up and show um, uh where we've done it in the past where you might not have thought to ask for something like that, but we know uh, you're potentially anxious really early on and you don't know, you don't know uh, how well this is going to go, but, but you're, you're probably wondering in the back of your mind if, if you haven't said, yeah. So thinking through that makes that process really smooth. And, and then it helps, it helps me stand out because um, others aren't doing that as much. And so it, it, it makes us very unique in that buying process, especially, and then delivering as we're, as we're delivering, it's less about, you know, check in the checkbox that we've done these tasks and more about checking in to see, uh, are, are we having the right impact? And um, is there anything you need to to promote this internally or, or, or something like that? And think it through your needs. So rather than, you know, really focusing on a, a contract or, or checking a checklist, um, we're, we're being more empathetic to everybody involved in the project and, and what are the things you might need that's that's not necessarily in the contract but that could that could help you and help make the project more successful so uh you touched on some of this but we haven't specifically talked about sort of the market and launch the the go to market part of our curriculum uh and and then again applying that i think to professional service you talked a little bit about the emotional and the sort of the the fear is way too strong a, a word right but the the sort of mm-hmm. concerns you have before you bought what else what else in those courses do you think that that you really sort of gravitated to uh, and deployed in your own pro- uh, practice? You know, the big one was buyer personas. And I think that was in, I can't remember now. I think it was in the marketing one. Yes. Um, but that that buyer persona idea. Uh, so we've, we've thought of user personas before. So that one I've done um, and then learned a lot more about. So that, that, Thought I was really happy to kind of get a good template and, and standardize the idea of user personas, but then taking, and so that's users of the software we deliver, but then taking that idea and building buyer personas and thinking through the different buyers um, uh, of the service. So, uh, you know, there could be someone in procurement who needs to make sure everything's compliant maybe with, with the project, but then there's uh, kind of the internal champion who who wants uh, a solution because their job's difficult and they want to. In our case, we do a lot of automation or or document management, and they want to streamline some of those processes. Um, thinking through their needs and how to arm them to to kind of sell it internally uh, and and the process they would go through. Uh, that was really interesting in a market sense because it really 
changed and, and helped me think more from uh, a customer side. How are they going to buy this? And, and um, you know, beyond just how are they going to discover it? But uh, the buying process is, is tricky because, you know, they see it and they like it, but there's so many different people that might be involved and think it through who those people are um, and, and kind of mapping that out and using these buyers personas. That was, that was a really valuable tool that just that one uh, especially really made a big difference uh, for me. One of my favorites uh, though, to be fair and biased on the product marketing <laughs> side of the house. But I think and I always say like, if, if you really understand your buyers, there's usually since we're B2B space, right? There's generally more than one. It, everything you do in marketing and go to market makes so much more sense, right? You understand the language they use, you know where they are, you understand the problems and how they describe them. And then you're really reflecting back to them, not in a parroting way, but in a, in a way that helps them uh, find themselves in your messaging, right? And, and for them to believe that you understand their pain and that you have a, a that you're credible in your ability to solve it. Super powerful. That credibility really nails it too. Yeah. But like, whereas before it would be, we talk a lot about features and, and it would be more technical talk, which, which resonates with some people in IT, but the actual buyers, the manager, you know, they, they have different questions and the procurement person, they have different questions mm-hmm. and, and finances involved. They have different questions. So whereas the sales might've taken a lot longer and, and again, thinking of that journey too, it might've added more anxiety because, you know, that, that manager who liked it and, and, you know, we're speaking the technical language to them, they don't have the right words then to go and sell this internally to, to finance saying, Oh, I want to approve this budget to do this project. Uh, We haven't armed them with enough. So we either have to hope they have enough or, uh, or hope they have a good relationship that would have been before. But now that we've thought through all these personas and that journey, we can make sure they have the right talking points, make sure we're, we're able to support them and know where else they need to go. And, and it makes it easier to connect and connect with the right people too. So that way we've matched the right projects and the right customers that, that are looking for the type of projects we do. All right. I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit here, Steve. So one of the very, very big things that we teach, right, are Nahido visits. So is that something that you guys have deployed? Can you tell me how that's going? This was another one of the biggest changes. So uh, in, in the last firm I worked at, we did a lot of, we did, we tried to do a lot of this thinking of um, product and how do we turn professional services into a product. And then looking back, you know, we've, we never did any Nahito visits. It was just, we got a bunch of us in a room and we brainstormed on a whiteboard. Um, but now the, the change is really to, to gather that and, and it's built into our, um, our CRM. So we have a little table that collects um, pain points and, and different data points we can get on customers for different interviews we do or different uh, things we could collect in the market. So if we see uh, like a post or, or a blog post or stuff like that, we'll collect that too. And then, uh, yeah, de- debriefing with customers because one of the things I learned from my last job uh, was nothing important really does happen in the office. Like uh, uh, the, the the hard part of that was if we don't go out and talk to other people and do the Nahito visits, we kept reinventing the same things and and we weren't really innovating, even though that's what we were trying to do. We had all the same people in the same room and drawing on the same whiteboards and and didn't really come up with new product ideas that resonated because we weren't talking to outside people. So yeah, that was one of the biggest uh, changes as well is, is, collecting those data points and and um, the terms they use and and understanding how it fits and then probing deeper uh, to to make sure um, we, we we understand it better um, uh, as we as we get it it's good we try and do a debrief on projects as well to get more uh, beyond just the lessons learned of how the project go and how are we to work with but but probing a bit on that to see you know, did we solve the problem and were there other problems and uh, did, did we surprise ourselves on this project and did you learn anything and, and was there anything we could have uh, uh, known ahead of time or taught you ahead of time to maybe expand the project or do something different? So that, that's always a good source. Um, I, have, I haven't been good at kind of the win-loss ones though, going to collect them from the loss, but, but definitely uh, other ones where we have good relationships, we really try and dig in and get more uh, information. And that's just helping us 
learn and, and like I say, we put it in our CRM tool and that, that collects a lot of data points too. So that way in the future, it'll, it'll benefit us even more too, I think. Now your homework now though, is to do the win loss too, because they're yes. <laughs> super powerful. Uh, and I've done them both direct, which is great, but I've also used some third parties because it is, I think it is one of the easiest things that gets sort of a downgrade. It's the thing that gets dropped um, yeah. just in the, in the rush for things and the different things. But, but I find, you know, and, and I find the information from the wins just as valuable as from the losses. Mm. Uh, and they're, they're both key, but yes, I, it's a, it, it, that's why sometimes a third party works uh, both from people being sometimes more forthright with them, mm-hmm. but also like they can have a steady stream going, um, you know, so Keep that's up your homework. That's a good idea. Yeah. I like that. Passing <laughs> it on from the instructors. Uh, uh, but, but, you know, in that same thing, and, and I'm, I'm, um, I'm not sure how the product role is divided in your organization, but one of the other things that we talk about uh, as sort of a first step is the gap analysis, right? How good are we doing these activities? How important are they to us as an organization in the spot, in the life cycle that we are? Uh, and, and what's the gap? How do we prioritize where to focus? Have you done that? You know, I, I did it for my previous organization as well, just to, because it was such, I remember doing it that night when I took the foundations course, because it was um, such a good experience to go through and, and eye opening that I, I went through there. I have it as a bit of a checklist. I haven't checked in on it recently enough though. So yeah, that's some more homework for me, but uh, no, I remember. <laughs> I'll stop assigning that. homework, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but it was quite eye opening and, and it's a good checklist to to make sure we kind of set ourselves up and, and don't fall into bad habits of, of stop talking to customers and moving into a room with a whiteboard with just ourselves. Uh, it could be easy to fall into those habits if, uh, if we don't have that kind of structure and that framework that, that encourages us to get out there and, and do more research that's, that's outside the office. I think it's good for keeping us honest. I also think, you know, uh, in all 37 boxes are important. Everything we teach in the, in the eight courses, I think is, is really valuable. But you do have to prioritize. There is just a limited number of resources. And that's the other reason it's good. It was n- what we don't want is for someone to be like, there's so much, I can't possibly do it all, right? It's like, no, of course you can't, but let's figure out what's the most important. Let's tackle that first, then let's add that thing. So, so it keeps focus, but I also think it sometimes relieves some of that tension and, and pressure of not being able to do all the different homework from all the <laughs> different courses that you want to, right? So it's good, it's good both ways. I agree. Yeah. And and that's been my experience. I'm, I'm more iterative. I, I still have the uh, the paper handout of the framework and and haven't gone through and checked them. I, I probably should. And that, that will help me focus. But uh, every once in a while, I kind of use that to think of, you know, what else to add as I get good at the other ones. But yeah, I've, I've gone through and used a bit more focus and pick, pick my favorites that that really uh, moved it a lot. But yeah, I agree. It's it's even just picking a little made a big difference. And and as I get more, and as we get more teams that could more on the team that could fill in more mm-hmm. of those blanks uh, can help as well. So one of the things that we've added to our products and in the, in the time that you've been attending our courses is the pragmatic alumni community. Mm-hmm. Um, and is, is that, I would love just to kind of get your thoughts on that and, and how you've used, utilize that and, uh, and, and where you've seen the value. It's been great. You know, I uh, I joined when they first launched it and um, there was a big rush of chatting and then it went quiet for a while. And then there was a big rush, I think, as, as everyone got used to it and, and came back. So it was, uh, it was, and I joined a whole bunch of communities in there. So I got to, that's another one. Maybe I got to focus more and, and pair back and think which ones I, I should really contribute to. But I, I got to meet a few people. Um, which was nice. So some of the discussions, I could add some things and, and they're more in my area, but as I was experimenting with some of the boxes and some of the product ideas uh, I've had, so some side projects or, or think it through from a services side, uh, it's been a good place to add questions and people have answered and then um, said, oh, hey, you know, I'll have a I'll have a quick Zoom with you if you want to talk through this. This is pretty mm-hmm. interesting. I, I've, I've, I've done the same thing last year. Um, and it's been neat. So I've made a couple of friends through there, which has been good beyond beyond ones I've gone to classes with. Uh, and, and they've connected with me and talked through it. And then uh, um, I, I, I'm trying to do the same thing now to pay it forward. But it, it's neat. It's a neat community of, I don't know how many people are in there, but there's, I know it started with 200 of us. So it's, it's a lot more than that now anyway. Um, 
but yeah, it's been, it's been a neat community of just so many different backgrounds. Cause there's a lot, uh, I mean, a full range, there's a lot in software that, that's, um, uh, you know, kind of in the same area as me, but then there's a lot in like healthcare and, and mm. physical products. And, uh, and so it's just so neat to see so many different perspectives, um, uh, you know, outside the class, because the classes are so, they're, they're full days. I mean, they're, they're, there's a lot of work. There's some group work and, and activities in each of them, um, but it's not the same as the community where it's more free, free form and, and people jump in and, and you get a lot of uh, connections that way. You know, and, and that's, that's my favorite part of the community is sort of those connections with people. And one of the things I find interesting is so many people wanted the community so they could find uh, people like them, people in the same industry with the same offerings. And there's a ton of value in that. But I also find such interesting value in the way people in completely, with completely different products mm -hmm. solve their problems because they really come at it from a different history with a different perspective. And sometimes there are pieces in there that are, are so applicable, but, but so foreign to how, you know, software as a service approaches it, but you see how hardware does it and you think, Oh, there's some kernels in there that are really interesting to explore. Yes. Yeah, I agree. And, and they're just um, interesting perspectives and backgrounds and, and yeah, interesting stories, but, but being able to discover that I wasn't expecting that really. I thought, like I joined a couple of the communities and it was like software as a service. And I'm, I'm kind of interested in that and wanted to learn more. So I have a bit of a fly on the wall listening to those, the, to the discussions, but then that moved me to, I can't remember what group that, that eventually brought me to. Um, but I eventually went and joined that one and it was completely different, not software people and, and talking about all relevant things that I'm interested in. Um, yeah. So it was a nice way to, to really expand my, my circles and, and, see how other products do it that you know still uh, that that's applicable which was neat yeah. so just yeah um because I, I remember when i started pragmatic they had a site but it was really to download templates and mm -hmm. that was valuable and good because all the templates were helpful but um that was missing yeah not to be able to hear how other people were using it and, and continue the conversation so yeah it was nice it was nice when they added in the the alumni community for sure. Awesome. All right, Steve, this has been super enjoyable and we've talked about a lot of different things. Uh, if you were going to have our listeners think about two things, two takeaways from your career, from, from the classes you've taken, you know, the, what you've done professionally, two things that they would maybe do differently tomorrow based on, on what we talked about today, what would it be? You know, the first one would really be focusing on the customer and the customer problem. Maybe people are already doing that more, but that was a big, and it seems in hindsight like such uh, common sense. I guess it, it's obvious in hindsight, but you know, really focusing on that uh, kind of opened my eyes and, and solved a lot of questions I had or, or a lot of blocks maybe I had. Uh, so that would be a big one. Really know it well, and and if you were to pick one thing, one block, I'd really choose that one first uh, and do it well. The other one is um, kind of a second one. I almost want to say buyer personas because I like that, but I already talked about it so much. So maybe I'll, I'll repeat myself, but I, I really like the buyer personas too, because thinking about the buyers, um, it helped me understand the process more and understand why um, sales cycles were maybe slowing down or why things weren't being adopted in the way I, th I thought they might've been um, because I was, I was really looking at it from my own lens and not from, how someone would want to buy or, or procure services so um and and solve a particular problem and make sure i'm speaking around there so the two kind of go hand in hand and they're really early i guess in in sort of selling and marketing but uh I, I'd, I'd probably leave it with those two is really you know what is the problem in the market and and really know that well because so much of the product design and product solutions come out of that. And then, yeah, really know the buyers, uh, the different people involved in, in that experience, um, um, in that journey. And then, yeah, the rest will sort of fall into place after that. But knowing those two, I think, are, are probably my two favorite today anyways. <laughs> and those are great ones, Steve. Perfect answers. All right, Steve, I really enjoyed our conversation. I hope you come back and talk to us along your path. Keep us updated. Um, it was very enjoyable. So thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, it was great. Thanks so much. That does it for today's episode. Thanks, everyone, for listening. 
And don't forget to join us next week when we tackle another great topic designed to help you elevate your product, your company, and your career.